Hallelujah. 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 First lesson for today was from the book of Joel, chapter 2, from verses 12 to 17. In Hebrews 12, 12 to 17. The book of Joel says, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious, for he is merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And Hebrews 12 says, Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed and pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no man can see God. There is a clear cry out unto us to return unto God to turn our lives around and to return to the path that leads to salvation. It's getting a little bit tiresome. Sermons over and over and over and over again about the same things. And it's almost like the sermons are being preached to walls. We have to change. We just have to change. The same mouth that we use to pray and praise God cannot be the same mouth we used to abuse one another cannot be the same mouth we used to gossip about each other's lives. Doesn't make any sense. The same hands that we lift up to worship God cannot be the same hands we used to strike one another and fight. The same heart and mind that we present to God in prayer and worship cannot be the same hearts that we used to harbor malice and grudges against one another. This same body that we call the temple of the Holy Spirit definitely cannot be the same body we used to commit acts of sexual immorality. Doesn't make any sense. We're not serving God. God will not be asking us to return unto Him if we're already with Him. We have to change. The book of Jeremiah Chapter 8. This song can start reading from verse 5. When then? Why then is this people of Jerusalem sliding back? It says, why then? Why, why, why is it that we keep sliding back? Why is it that we keep hearing sermons over and over again? And I refuse to change, and you refuse to change. Why is it? that we keep sliding back. By perpetual backsliding. In a perpetual backsliding. Meaning it's almost like it's a hopeless case. <laughs> Sunday, we're good, we hear the sermon, and as soon as we leave the church, from that very point on, in the car ride back home, throughout the rest of the week, we start backsliding. And then we come back on Sunday, have mercy upon me, oh God. And it's a whole cycle again. God is like we're in a perpetual backsliding. What is going on? Continue. They hold fast the seat. It says we hold fast the seat. They refuse to return. And we refuse to return. We refuse to return to God. Continue. I hearkened and heard. God said, I, I hearkened and I heard. But it speak not aright. But you're not speaking aright. I listened. I listened. I listened when, when, when you said, have mercy upon me, O God. I listened to your prayers. 
I listen every day when you come to me and worship, but you have not spoken it right. Continue. No man repented him, him of his wickedness ways. It says no man repented him of his wicked ways. Saying, saying, what have I done? Saying, what have I done? We just, we, we've become so monotonous. We've become like robots, just coming and going through the motions. Oh Lord, have mercy upon me because I've seen no one and unknownly. God said, no one has truly come before me saying, what have I done? No one has come with that heart of repentance, with that heart of brokenness. Saying, what have I done? Does it make any sense that I'm still harboring malice against this woman? Does it make any sense that I'm still harboring malice against this man? What have I done? Am I, am I, am, does it make any sense that I just left somebody's house sinning and I'm, and, and I'm seeking to come to church to praise and worship God? Does it make any sense that I'm carrying my tree of thanks offering and I'm dancing and I can't stand this person that's standing next to me? What have I done? Have you truly gone to God with a heart of contrition, with a heart of brokenness, asking for forgiveness? Continue. Everyone turned to his course. It says everyone has turned to his own course. As the horse rushing into battle. As the horse rushing into battle, we're all doing our own thing. We know what is right. We're all worshiping God in our own way. Continue. Yeah, the, the stork in the heaven knoweth her go to Go to verse 10. Therefore, it says, therefore, will I give their wives unto others? It says, I will give their wives to others, but this not be a portion. Continue. Amen. And their fields to them that, that shall inherit them. It says, and their fields to those who will inherit them. For everyone from this least even unto the greatest. It says, for everyone from the least even to the greatest. Is given to covetousness. Is given to covetousness. Always coveting what is not yours. Always coveting other people's goods. Always coveting other people's belongings. Always coveting other people's wives. Continue. From the prophet even unto the priest. He says from the prophet even to the priest. Everyone dealeth falsely. Everyone deals falsely. There is no truth in us anymore. We've become so comfortable with lies. That the truth has become foreign in our lips. Continue. For they have healed the herd of the daughter of my people slightly. Saying. Saying. Peace. 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 When there is no peace. When there is no peace. Who sent you? Everybody wants the power of prophecy. Yeah, you're going and, and, and prophesying things God hasn't sent you. Saying peace, peace. When God hasn't proclaimed any peace. Saying just do this and do that and do this prayer and do that prayer. When God hasn't sent you any message. Continue. Were they ashamed when they committed ab abomination? It says were they ashamed when they committed abomination? When you sinned, were you broken? When, when, when you realized that you had lied? When you realized that, 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 that you broke the commandments of God? When you realized that you committed iniquity? Were you even broken inside? Were you hurt that you committed a sin? When you struck somebody across the face, did that bother you that you did something wrong? When you walk around harboring malice in your heart, do, does that even bother you or have we become comfortable keeping sin in our hearts? When somebody asks you to do something for them or asks you to share something with them and you know you have it, does it bother you by turning the other direction saying, no, I'm not going to share it with you? Does it bother you at all? If those things don't bother you, if we become comfortable in that, then we have to return to God. We're not heading in the right direction at all the book of Revelation chapter 2 if someone can read from verse 21 God shouldn't be the one telling us in Joel and I gave her one second God, God, God shouldn't be the one telling us to return unto him rend your hearts and rend your garments it's for our own sake. God shouldn't be have to. God shouldn't have to be pleading with us to return unto Him. It is for our own salvation. God is fine where He is. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. But yet He's reaching out to us and telling us to rend our hearts and to return unto Him. Go ahead. The Book of Revelation. I have even had time to repent of my immorality. It says, "I gave you time, and I'm giving you time to repent of your immorality, to repent of your sin." The reason you're alive till this very second is for you to return unto God, not for you to continue to sin. God said, I'm giving you time to repent of your sexual immorality, to repent of your waywardness, to repent of your lack of forgiveness. That's why I'm giving you time. Continue. But she is unwilling. 
But she's unwilling. Instead, I gave Israel time. I, I gave I gave this woman time to repent of her sexual morality, but she was unwilling. She did not repent. Continue. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering. God is like, now I've had enough. So now I will cast her into a bed of suffering. Continue. I will, I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely. Continue. Unless they repent of her ways. So not only her, but those that are committing iniquity with her, both of them, I will begin to punish them until they repent of their sins. You that you are gossiping, and you that you are listening to the gossip and pouring more fuel into the fire, both of you, God is saying, is going to deal with you. Mm. Because when somebody comes to you and says, oh, did you hear what happened to X, Y, and Z? You can respond and say, I didn't hear and I don't want to hear. Thank you. But you can choose to sit there and listen and begin to continue to add fuel to the fire. It is up to you. God has had enough. God said, if Sodom and Gomorrah, if they heard half of the sermons you people heard, if they saw half of the miracles you people saw, those people have repented. How much more us? How much for us that we have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, that we have this entire Bible, and that we have sermons every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Friday on TV, and yet we still choose not to repent to God. May God have mercy upon us. Amen. In verse 23, it says, I am he who searches the minds and the hearts of men. I search the, heart, the, the hearts and the minds. There are some sins that you commit that don't even come out but you're committing it within. What did Lucifer say? He said he wanted to, he said Lucifer thought within his heart that he wanted to rise above God. Yes. He didn't do it all, he was just thinking it within him. And God cast him down because God searches the hearts and the minds of men. So what sins are you harboring inside? Who is that person that you hate that is still keeping it inside you? Whether you do something or not, God sees your heart. God sees your heart. Brethren in the Lord, we have to change. The book of Ezekiel chapter 18, it's, 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 it's not enough for us to just keep hearing sermons. We have to start putting it into practice. We have to return unto God. The time is far spent. It's far spent. It's far spent. No one knows when that time is going to end. Because the end of time may not come until next year, it doesn't mean that your life is guaranteed till tomorrow. The person that died today doesn't have to wait till rapture anymore. Their judgment, they have, they, they have no more opportunities, right? They have no more opportunity to sin, they have no more opportunity to repent. But you're still alive, and you're using your breath to curse somebody else. You're using your breath to put other people down. Ezekiel 18 from verse 30. It says, therefore, I will judge, I will judge you, judge you o, house o house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, everyone according to his ways says, the Lord God, says the Lord your God, repent, repent and, turn yourselves from all your and turn from what? From all your transgressions. Repentance is one thing. Turning is another thing. Repentance is one thing. Conversion is another thing. To repent is, is that act of contrition. Is that act of brokenness. Is, is you coming to yourself and saying, what have I done? That is repentance. That is part one. And then you have to turn from your transgressions. You have to convert it. You have to be changed. There must be a change of your heart. There must be a change of your attitude. There must be a change of your personality. There must be a change of who you are. Continue. So that, so iniquity shall not be their ruin. So that iniquity will not be their ruin. Cast away from, cast away from all your transgressions. Okay. Whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit for why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, said the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and leave ye. Thank you. It says, get yourself a new heart and a new spirit. I have no pleasure in the death of the unrighteous. It doesn't make God happy when you die in sin. God wants us to sleep in righteousness and be translated to his heavenly glory. He has no pleasure of the death of a sinner. That's why he gives us this time to return unto him, to change our ways. Acts 3.19 says, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come. 
We're all praying for times of refreshing, but we don't want to repent. We're all praying for times of refreshing, but we don't want to turn from our ways. You want times of refreshing, but you don't want to forgive. You want times of refreshing, but you don't want to stop lying. You want times of refreshing, but you don't want to stop sinning. It doesn't work that way. God says repent and be converted and be changed. Don't wait till next Sunday to say, okay, okay, I'm not in a good mood today. I'll call her on Saturday. I will, I will settle things. Are you the owner of time? That you have the audacity to tell yourself that you are guaranteed next Saturday to pick up the phone and talk to someone. And God is sitting there looking at you. Like that man that said, I will spread out my hands and I'll build more and I'll build more and I'll build more. God said, you fool. Your life will be required of you tonight. Do not leave this house of worship today without settling your differences between one another. Because even if God, God forbid, Mr. A and B are fighting and Mr. A is the one that did something bad and Mr. A decides to wait. And then Mr. B dies and goes to heaven. Now Mr. A didn't have a chance to go to Mr. B and say, I'm sorry. Don't wait. But one of the biggest issues that I also notice is we deal with a lack of recognition of some of our sins that we commit. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Someone could read from verse 6. You know, it's easy to say, okay, I don't steal, I don't kill, I don't commit adultery, I don't do all these things. Continue. Your glorifying is not good. It says your glorifying is not good. The fact that you're sitting there and thinking that, okay, I think, I think I'm think i doing okay. God said that's, that's, that's not a good thing that you're doing. Continue. Know ye not that a little living. It says, do you not know that a little leaving. Living at the whole lump. Leaving the whole lump. Do you know that a little leaving, a little sin, that sin that you're ignoring. Don't you know that it leavens the entire lump? Continue. Purge out therefore the old living. It says therefore purge out the old leaven. That ye may be a new lump. That you may be a new lump. As ye are unliving. Okay. For even Christ that our Passover is sacrificed for us. Yes. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old living, neither with the with the living of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Thank you. But with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Yes, you have a just just a little bit of sin. You have a, you're not committing all these big things. But God is saying, don't you know just that little leaving? Just that little one messes up the entire thing. Do you you you, you fail to recognize <laughs> that your lack of faith is very displeasing to God. Okay, you don't commit any sin, but yet you continue to come here and act like God is incapable of solving your problems. Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if you are keeping all the commandments in the entire world, and you're living a life of righteousness, and you don't have faith. It says it is impossible for you to please God. You are giving alms, you are loving everyone, but yet you continue to act faithless. You are not pleasing God. You're not pleasing Him at all. What more does God have to do for you to prove to you that He's capable of solving your problem? Just a few months after God split open the rest for the Israelites, they began to grumble again. Oh, where is water going to come from? Where is this going to come from? Hasn't, hasn't God performed at least one miracle in your life that you can look back on and say the same God that did this for me then can also break me out of the situation I am in now? Yes. It's possible. This is God we're talking about. Yes. But you cannot walk around with that little leaving of unfaithlessness. You know, Saul, God granted him so many victories over even armies that they weren't supposed to conquer. <laughs> but then Goliath came into the picture and all of a sudden, 
Saul was nowhere to be found. He had his armor on, he had everything, but he was not going out to fight. And here comes little David, with no experience, saying, who is this man? That is, that is, that is speaking blasphemy against my God. Let me go fight him. Saul said, what is wrong with this guy? Does he, does he not know about Goliath? This is the same Saul that God had already granted victories in wars for. <laughs> Saul said, okay, if Saul was a loving person, <laughs> he would have, he, this, is, this, is, this is the king. He could have easily told David not to go. But he said, okay, go, do whatever you want to do. Go and fight this Goliath. Because David came in faith. But something funny happened. What did Saul do? He said, wait. He took off his armor, right? And put it on David. It wasn't that the armor was too heavy. Think about it, David, that killed a lion and a bear with his hands. You are now telling me the armor that Saul wore was too heavy? No, that wasn't the reason. But the reason was Saul took off his armor, faithlessness, and put it on David. And as soon as David took the first step, he was like, no, I can't move any further. He said, I beg, king, I can't, I can't do this. So he took it off. And then he was able to move forward. And God led him. And he destroyed Goliath. When you come around without faith, it weighs you down. You're unable to defeat the battles before you. You're unable to conquer those mountains before you. Before Jesus did any miracle, he said, do you believe that I can do this? Do you have faith? And as soon as they said yes, and he saw their heart, then he performed the miracle. And the one thing I also want to add is, God may not always change your situation. But with faith, he will change the outcome. Amen. Amen. He didn't change the situation uh -huh. that David was an inexperienced soldier. He didn't change the situation that David was not fit to fight this man. He didn't change the situation that David had no business fighting this battle. But the outcome, he changed. Hallelujah. That Goliath was defeated. Yeah. Right? Yes. I use myself as an example. You all know my story of medical school and this and that. God didn't change my situation that I had failed so many exams. I still have the paper, everything is still there. God didn't change my situation that I got rejected from so many hospitals, everything is still there. In three years, and applications to over 600 hospitals, I got just one interview. Just one. Just one interview. And there I got accepted, and there I did my residency, and there I finished. And now I'm practicing. God didn't... I still have those failed exams. They're still there. They're still there. God didn't change my situation. But the outcome is different. The doctor may say you have a sickness in you that is going to cause you to die in two months. Brethren in the Lord, God may not take that sickness away, but he will grant you 40 years extra to live, even with that sickness within you. But you must have faith. Don't tell God how to do things. The man does things his own way, so don't try to figure him out. Just have faith that your outcome will be different. That is just what your focus should be. Let the doctors say whatever they want. Let your employer say whatever they want. You just know that your outcome will be different. But brethren in the Lord, you cannot walk around with a spiritlessness. It is not pleasing to God. It doesn't make God happy. If you don't have faith in God, how can God do something for you? If you don't believe you can do it. We have to change. We're almost done. The book of Isaiah chapter 1. If someone can read from verse 5. Why, sh why, why should you be beaten anymore? God said, why, why, why should you be beaten anymore? Why should I keep punishing you people? You know, God, God says he disciplines those he loves. Right? When he sees us messing up, he'll discipline us so that we can return unto him. Uh -huh. But God is tired. He said, why should I even discipline you people anymore? Continue. Why do you persist in rebellion? He says, why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured. 
<laughs> can someone can someone find can someone find the King James version? Why should you be stricken anymore? It says, why should you be stricken anymore? He says you will revolt more and more. I'm tired of disciplining you. You know, it's like a father that, that, that his son messes up and he spanks him. Don't do it again. Don't do it again. And the next day, he does it. He spanks him. And the next day, he does it. And he spanks him. After a while, the father will get tired of spanking his son because the sin that is doing nothing. Because you just continue to sin. You just continue to revolt more and more. How many times are you going to talk about, oh, have faith, have faith in God, yet you still come to God without faith? He says you revolt more and more. Continue. The whole head is sick. He says the whole head is sick. And the whole heart faints. The whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness. He said the entire body, from the sole to the head, there is no soundness in it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I'm tired of it. What, 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 what more do I have to do? How many more sermon, um, sermons must be preached? Go to verse 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices? To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? I just want you to turn your heart around to me. I just want you to live in love. I just want you to live in righteousness. I'm tired of your sacrifices. Continue. I am full of burnt offerings of rams. I'm full of your burnt offerings of rams. I'm full of your candles that you to do things of every Sunday. I'm tired of candles. I have enough. I don't want your candles anymore. I want your heart. I want your heart of righteousness. I want you to change. I want you to stop being angry. I want you to stop fighting. I want you to stop lying. I want you to stop sinning. I'm tired of all these things. Continue. And the fat of fed beasts. Continue. And I delight not in the bloods of bullocks. I'm tired of all these sacrifices. Go to verse 12. When you come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand? Who required this at your hand? Continue. To tread my court. To trample my courts. You come in here bringing, bringing soap and, and this and that. Who told you to bring all these things to give thanks offering unto me? And you think I'm going to accept it when you're still harboring malice against someone in your heart and you're dancing with trade. Well, I, I didn't ask any of this. I didn't ask this from you. Continue. Bring no more vain oblations. He says, bring no more vain oblations to me. Incense is an abomination. Your incense, me. your incense, this hand that you used to sin last night, you're now using it to carry the incense and you're doing this. Yara Sarah, God said your incense is an abomination to me. Continue. The new moons and Sabbath, Continue. the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. It says, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. I cannot endure the fact that you still sin, you refuse to change, and that you come and you worship. You can't, those two don't mix. Those two don't mix. Continue. Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hated. Go to verse 16. Wash ye. It says wash ye. Make you clean. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings Put from before away my eyes. the evil of your doings from before my eyes. This is what God is requesting of us. Cease to do evil. Cease to do evil. Continue. Learn to do well. Learn to do good. Learn to do well. Continue. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. God is saying, let us reason together. Come. Come now and let us reason together. Go ahead. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be like red, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Thank you. No matter what it is you have done, God is giving you a second chance today. He's saying, though your sins may be as red as scarlet, you could have committed the worst sin ever. God is saying, come, let's reason together today. I'll make you to be as white as snow. But you have to come with a heart of contrition, with a heart of repentance. And you have to make that decision today that you are going to return to God. Luke 17 from verse 20. Brother in the Lord, at the end of the day, it's all about the kingdom. And when he was and when he was demanded of the Pharisees. When he was demanded of the Pharisees. When the kingdom of God shall come. When the kingdom of God should come. He answered them and said. He answered them and said. The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. The kingdom of God does not come with looking. It doesn't come with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here, or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. For behold the what? The kingdom of God is within you. Yes. 
Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added onto it. And now this is telling us that the kingdom of God is already within you. I'll read Romans 14, 17. It says the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So if they're saying the kingdom of God is within you, that kingdom of God that is righteousness, that kingdom of God that is joy, that kingdom of God that is peace, that is what God is asking for all of us to have within us. On the day of judgment, your passport into heaven is your heart. If God looks and he does not see his kingdom in there, there is no way he can allow you into his kingdom. He must first see his reflection within you. If God cannot see his face in your heart, if God cannot see his kingdom within you, there is no way he can let you in. So now is the day to fill yourself with righteousness. Now is the day to return to God. Now is the day to change of our ways. It is not worth it. It is not worth it. That grudge, that act of lying, that act of stealing, that act of adultery, all of it's not worth it. Heaven is way too precious for us to miss it. And there may be some difficult decisions for you to make for this kingdom of God. Because there are some people that are bound for hell and that you're still associating yourself with. There are some people that are drawing you away from your God. But because you care about keeping those relationships and then you sacrifice the kingdom of God, God is looking at you and saying, okay. It says it is better for you to go into heaven with one hand than to go, with, than to, go to hell with two hands. It says if your right arm causes you to sin, cut it off. If there are people in your life that are causing you to sin, that are taking you away from God, now is the time to begin to unfriend them. Now is the time to begin to remove them from Instagram. Now is the time to begin to separate yourself from them because they are not going to take you to heaven. They're not. They're not. They're not. After Saul was converted and he became Paul, do you think he kept the same group of friends that he had beforehand? He had to sever those relationships. He had to cut them off. Brethren in the Lord, fix your kingdom today. The kingdom of God that is within you. Yes, ma'am. Joy in the Holy Ghost, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Oh, don't you want to be part of this kingdom? Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. We shall all be part of the kingdom in Jesus' name. Yes. Fix your kingdom. Two more and then we're done. Ephesians 4.28. It says, let him who stole steal no longer. But rather, Ephesians 4 from 28. But rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. So if you were stealing before, now stop stealing. But don't only stop stealing. Now get a job and start working. But don't only start working. Now take some of your earnings and give to those that are in need. So you're not just repenting and you're not just changing. Don't just say, okay, I'm forgiving you. Let's settle the fight. Embrace that person. Take them in. Help them when they're in need. Go that extra step. Go that extra mile so that you won't just make it into heaven, but you have a crown adorned with many stars. It says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. This is God breaking just practical. The words that come out of your mouth, don't let it be something that hurts others. You hear parents say, tell their children, oh, you never amounted to anything. Oh, you're no good. Don't even say it as a joke. God is telling us right now, don't let any corrupt word come out of your mouth. Only things that edify, only things that build up, only things that lift up. Let people hear the words of your mouth and let their sorrows be turned to joy. Don't let them hear you speak and, and cower and say, oh, I, I, I don't want to hear this person talk again. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God 
Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and all evil speaking be put away from you. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. This is very straightforward. Brethren in the Lord, we know what to do. It's not that we don't know it, we do. All I'm saying is, let's do it. Let's change. And I close with this. It's a story we're all familiar with. Luke 15. It's the story of the prodigal son. Everyone knows what happened, right? He was in his father's house. His father hooked him up with everything. He was doing good. And he just woke up one day. You know what? Pops, I'm done. Give me, give me what belongs to me. <laughs> takes the money, takes everything, goes out, squanders everything. But something interesting happened. Verse 17 of Luke 15. And when he came to himself. It says when he came to himself. This is the point I want all of us to get to. I want all of us to come to ourselves. I want all of us to make that realization and ask, what have I done? What have I been doing with my life? How have I been living every day holding a grudge against this person? How have I been lying and stealing and committing adultery and looking upon other women's other other women and other men and, and, and when, when I have my own spouse at home? How am I still doing all these things? Come to yourself today. Let, 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 let the Holy Spirit minister to your heart. Come to yourself. It says he came to himself and he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? How many of my father's servants are doing good? And, and he perishes with hunger. And here he is, <laughs> over here, perishing with hunger. Why are you suffering? You know, that, that person that you're holding a grudge against, that person is doing good. Yeah. God is blessing them. And you're going on like this. I'll never forget them. Okay. Who are you? Who are you exactly? They're doing good. And you're walking around with bitterness. You don't know that that bitterness that you're holding in your heart is bringing you down. It's drawing you away from God. It's stopping your own blessing. It's stopping your own times of refreshing. That person is already getting refreshed. And here you are still praying to God, asking for times of refreshing. And yet yours is not coming because you choose not to forgive. Let's change. Continue. I will arise and go to my father. He said, I will arise and go to my father. And will say unto him. And say unto him. This father. is the act of repentance. This is the act of contrition. And say, Father, father I have sinned against heaven. I've sinned against heaven. And before, and before you. And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. I'm not even worthy to be called your son. This is how broken he was after he realized what he had done. Continue. Make me as one of thy high. He said, servants. don't even make me your son. Now make me like one of your servants. All I'm asking is that you take me in. God, all I'm asking is that you embrace me again. God, all I'm asking is that you please accept me into your bosom again. Continue. He arose. And he arose. And he came to his father. And he came to his father. When he was yet a great way off. Again. His father saw Reread that part again. But when he was yet uh -huh. a great way off, a what? A great way off. Okay. His father saw him. Okay. And had compassion. Okay. And ran. Okay. And fell on his neck. Okay. And kissed him. Hold on one one second. When he was still what? A great way off. You know the beautiful thing about this God that you serve. This God that I serve. You make a decision today. That you're going to forgive, you're going to forget, you're going to love, you're going to move forward, you're going to live a right life of righteousness. And every morning you're waking up, making that determination that you're going to do good. God sees you from a far away place. He sees your intentions. He sees your heart. He says, okay, this person is legitimately making that decision to return to me. God doesn't even wait for you to come to him. He runs. <laughs> Brethren in the Lord, it said God ran out to him. He ran out to him. God misses you so much. God misses your love. God misses your righteousness. God misses your service, your genuine service so much. God hates the fact that we continue to fight. God hates the fact that we continue to harbor malice. God hates the fact that we continue to deal unjustly. God hates it. But when he sees that you're making that decision every day to return onto him, he says God is so excited to see. He says he runs out. He doesn't even wait for you to return fully. He says, because you know what? It is so hard. It is so hard to live this life of righteousness in this world of sin. 
You're surrounded with temptations every single day. You're surrounded with sin every single day. You want, you want to curse out your boss every single day because you're working so hard and he doesn't even appreciate what you're doing. You just want to be angry. You want to do so many things wrong. God, see, it is so hard to live a life of righteousness and God knows that. But all God is looking for is for that heart of contrition and for that desire for you to change. And when he sees that you're actually making those efforts to do it, he himself will come and embrace you and kiss you. And then give you the strength to overcome all those temptations. He says, Peter, the devil came to save you as well, but I prayed for you. If God does not pray for you, we cannot overcome these things. But God cannot pray for you if you don't come unto him. He cannot. He says he embraced him. He kissed him. He put a robe on him. He killed the best ram and everything for him. God celebrates your return unto him. God celebrates your righteousness. That's why the first lesson of today says, after your repentance, God may even leave behind a big blessing for you, a blessing you didn't even ask for. Yes. Repent. Change. Every morning when you wake up, just ask yourself, just tell yourself this one thing. God, today, I'm going to make you proud. I'm going to make you proud, oh God. And as you walk through your day, let that statement ring in your mind. And before you act, think, is that thing going to make God proud? And if you don't think it is, stay away from it. The fact that I'm still holding on to this thing, is, is God proud about this? No. So let it go. If I tell my boss, and I call in sick today and I know nothing is wrong with me. Is God going to be proud about that? If I decide to just drink a little alcohol, knowing that the tenants of the church and worship says no drinking, is that going to make God proud? Make the effort to make God proud every single day. God knows it's not easy. He wants me to change. He wants you to change. Brother in the Lord, enough is enough. Yes. Let a sermon do something to us. Let it move us back onto God. Mm -hmm. Do not let today end if you hold a grudge against anyone. If there is any sin that you can change, if there is anything you can do today, don't let the night fall until you make that change. May God bless his holy words. Amen.